Uh, my name is Jack Darby. I have a website that uh, mirrors Austin Police Department on data. I'm Chris Tomlinson. Uh, I'm formerly with the Observer, where I was the project manager on the Observer iPad app, and I'm now the Bureau Chief of the Associated Press here in Austin. Woohoo! I'm Lewis Knight, um, PhD student at the University of Texas, one of the younger students. I'm a, I'm a former uh, uh, Cindy Royal student at Texas State, and uh, I'm here because uh, Cindy has uh, never steered me wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, my name is Tracy Young, and uh, I, I graduated from UT last year. I'm now a first year new faculty at Texas State. I'm Pierce Presley, and I'm a freelance writer. There's no code for can't be anybody. Uh, and uh, I've just I've been into computers and actually far longer in general than I like for both of I'm Bob Meskell, I'm a technical writer. I usually follow the software development. You know, well, one person out of 100 likes doing computer guys and online help and that kind of stuff. And I'm a prodigal journalist who's just kind of coming back to see where the writing. Jim Busby, I'm between jobs doing some contracting and really interested in getting deeper into what, what you're doing here. I'm Nero Zabula. Uh, I'm part of the technology team at the Texas Tribune where we do neat stuff with government data and make it useful. Uh, that team is slowly growing, so if you are a Django developer or know some, it's in the line. I'm Chris Chang. I work with Ron at the New York Tribune. I'm Travis Weisgood, and I also work at the Tribune. Yay, Tribune and Keepall. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm John, I'm a student at UT, and this generally interested in how technology can be used to further more colleges. What's your major? Computer uh, science. Okay. Yeah. Bring more UT students with you to the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew, and I'll tell you one more second because I've got slides. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs>
going hardcore right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, Cindy went with filibuster, but you know, I, that's in the second half because the first half is just full of me griping about the stuff that led to filibuster. Um, yeah, so this is a talk that I gave at Refresh Austin about four or five months ago. And I called it this because I couldn't really think of a better name for it. But, um, and then I put this here because um, I, I, I always have to remind myself. Um, so I work at I work at Gowala, I'm a developer, um, and if you haven't checked in here, you should um, okay. right now. But if you don't have the client, then just you know forget about it for now because I need your attention over here. Um, okay. Okay. Hold on, give us a second. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody set up Where a spot? Where is it in the in the like old Burt Reynolds movies? Anybody have a value? Does <laughs> <laughs> everybody pull <laughs> hard? I'm just gonna move on. Now. <laughs> Um, it's, a degree from, it's a degree from UT, which means that, um, like, apparently everyone in this room, I was, uh, uh, I, took, I took a class taught by, by City Royal, um, which is, is, I'm slowly realizing it's the least exclusive club in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just how you know everyone. My students are a good resource for me, yes, they get things done for me sometimes. <laughs> Sounds like everybody's afraid of you, too. No. <laughs> um, although only technically, because it was only for a few weeks and it was a web design class that was at 9 a.m. and had an attendance policy, so that was not work. Um, but I feel like we've reconciled. <laughs> <laughs> Say so. <laughs> um, uh, I also worked at the Daily Text and I spent Four semesters, uh, in total of a little over a year, um, as the online editor, and I'm showing you this. Just, you know, I have the T-shirt to prove it. Um, I like the back of the T-shirt better. Um, <laughs> this was after a particularly combative year, but with um, I think the, the particular issue was with the, the placement of uh, cameras on the UT campus and, and the text and feeling feeling like that that should be information that that. That could be obtained under under FOIA, but uh, I think a judge disagreed. So that was it. Uh, so the beauty of this is I could just it's a right. hashtag. Uh, so if you want a hashtag, somebody just asked about a hashtag. You can just do hacks hackers ATX. I know it's long, but that's what you want to use. Okay. Um, so the 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 question I, I sort of wanted wanted to answer sort of the, the central question of the talk is, is how can the web make government better, um, but almost immediately you have to sort of, you have to define what better is because um, people will disagree disagree about it. My definition involves um, uh, transparency, um, which uh, which isn't. It was, which is sort of a complex thing I'll get into later, but um, it just involves the idea that um, you know everything that government does is sort of by default open for, for people to observe, unless there's a reason why it it, it uh, needs not to be. Um, shorter feedback loops is one of my things because um, uh, one of the Things that 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 is said as a reason for the low level of local participation reason is the idea that people don't see a connection between what what happens um, in government, especially the federal government, and and what happens in their everyday lives. Um, and I think I think that that technology can sort of make that more apparent. Um, this is this is another important one to me. Um, Political news, especially, tends to be uh, pretty easily categorized into signal and noise. Um, there, are, there are things that actually matter in the sense that we will still remember that they happened 40 years from now. And then there are things like an embarrassing thing a politician said the other day. Um, and various forms of media are, are really good at one but not the other. Um, I would say that TV news, you could argue at best, amplifies both signal and noise equally. Um, although I would argue that, it, that it's way better at amplifying noise. Um, it's not yet clear to me what the legacy of the web is going to be. That's regard. 
whether um, yeah, wh whether it's going to do better than TV in that respect. Um, the issue with noise is that because it's largely just throwing up chaff and, and um, people shouting one another in, in, in echo chambers, it doesn't it's the sort of thing that pre that prevents us from going forward. And if you look at government as um, people who have disagreements just trying to find a way forward, um, then that noise is actually detrimental to, to the process of government. So this is, some, this is something I'm concerned with, um, is um, uh, make, making it so that, so that we go beyond sort of the first level of, of, um, of knee-jerk talking points. Um, I think the web can help in this area uh, for several different reasons. Um, none of these are really new. This is just stuff that makes the web valuable just to apply to politics. So um, the web, I, I, I credit the web for um, only the, in the last few, few years, it seems, have we started to hold television pundits accountable for things that they say. Because the TV has such, such uh, a short memory. Um, and it's, it's, it's taken organizations to, you know, to sort of, sort of catalog the ridiculous things they say and, 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 and hold them accountable. Um, what, what comes to mind is, is something like, like um, uh, what's the, the, the Friedman unit, right? The, who's the, Tom Friedman, is that his name? The New York Times guy who, for a period of two or three <coughs> years, would keep saying on TV shows and in his columns that the next 18 months would, would be the critical time in the, the, the Iraq war. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so um, people started sort of satirically referring to a freedom unit as, an, as a nebulous amount of time that's mm -hmm. always the next 18 months from whenever you say it. Mm. Um, You're in software development. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to try really hard not not to realize the the, the parallels. In, in the um, so it's easy to reach, and in, in and by that I mean um, knowledge is less valuable the more you know the more effort you have to go through to retrieve it. Um, there there are a lot of you know if you if you had to go into a library into a back room. And in a dusty book, um, just to figure out how ridiculous Tom Friedman was, then, then you'd probably never do it. Um, it can support greater depth, um, and I, I say that just like it has the capability to, to support greater depth. I'm not saying that it actually does, um, but it's it's not constrained in the same way that newspapers like are, are constrained in column inches or um, or television media is constrained by by airtime by a number of hours in the day. Um, this is my favorite one. It's got URLs. Um, does anyone remember ever having to like argue politics with someone when you couldn't, like in a world before URLs, when you had to sort of vaguely refer to, put your hand down, you're just trying to sabotage my talk. No. <laughs> um, I've done it. It, but it, but it sucks. We used to be just having mimeographs. We didn't even have photocopies. So that's, when that's, you say that's true, and everything was purple. What's up with that? You know, when you say, do you remember? You're dating yourself because all no. of the graybeards here, we all. <laughs> I'm making ironic references. It wasn't. It wasn't that long ago. Um, but mimeograph. Yes, I love the smell. But like once, like speaking, I mean for myself, once we had URLs. It became, for me, really difficult to have discussions about politics in, um, in person, uh, out of reach of the computer, because then you you know you're just make, make like you know that what someone just said is wrong, but um, your source for that is something that you read several years ago and you can't remember when or where it mm -hmm. was or who wrote it, um, and that's that's a, that's just no fun. Um, so this is this is a brilliant thing that I just uh, stumbled across yesterday. Um, political arguments on, on Twitter are only possible because of URLs, because other, like like otherwise you would not be able to get to any sort of level of depth. Um, so you know 
in, instead of trying to say important things in 140 characters, you say so you say something pithy in 120 and use the, the, the remainder of your tweet to post a URL. Um, this, is, this is a Twitter bot that a guy in Australia wrote. Here we go. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> there we go. Um, because uh, he noticed that, that, that there was sort of a, a, a bit of a, 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 a climate change deniers echo chamber. Uh, in Twitter, and really, if Twitter is good for anything, it's for it's for being an echo chamber, um, and not like not not that not not that he thought that there weren't valid arguments to be to to have or whether climate change was real, but but it bothered him that people kept repeating um, off debunked arguments um, against climate change, and so he wrote a, a bot that searched for those occurrences and actually and responded with links. To like refuting them, um, and it's and it's, we're talking like fifty thousand tweets now, um, and so it's it's something like this, where, um, you know, like I I have no idea how it works. I imagine it's just looking looking for for keywords and phrases and um, and and you know like link, like using that to determine oh this must be the argument that that everyone in the seventies thought that. That, uh, that the planet was going to cool, and then and then responding with URLs that specifically debunk that. Um, I think this is the way that um, uh, I think that 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 URLs are are important to journalism being relevant um, online. Um, and let's see, yeah. I, so these were examples I had in my refresh talk, and I'm sure they're a bit more. Uh, I'm sure most people in this room know about them, but I left them in because they sort of illustrate the point. So factcheck.org. <laughs> Raise your hand if you don't, if if you want me to go into detail on it on any of these. But um, you know, sort of uh, been, been around for, for quite a while. Uh, the, yeah, the the truth meter um, assessing the whether. The things politicians say are, are actually true. I like I like the nuance here, um, rather, rather than just true or false, because because most things are are really hard to categorize that way. Um, yeah, and relatively, the the obometer. Um, <laughs> I like this because it's it's a completely different perspective on how we should judge the, the success of the presidency. Um, especially, like, especially with, with presidential elections, they're so often um, waged with with emotional arguments um, that this is going like completely to the other side of the spectrum and presenting like a rubric of uh, like like if you were to assess a president like a, a, a if, you're, if you're if you were to give a president a score in like in the most autistic way possible. Um, and so, like, I, I think I think combining that with 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 sort of the more um, the 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 more emotional aspects of um, deciding whether you whether you're going to vote for or against someone, I think averaging the two ends up um, presenting a full picture. That's why I like uh, the Obama. Um, Open Congress uh, is. Is newer. Uh, I'm a big fan of it because um, so it's it it's a compendium of all congressional activity. Um, what they do that's unique is they they have the text of of all bills under consideration, and every single paragraph is permalinkable, and every single paragraph is is commentable. So, so you see, so yeah, there are a couple of this is the healthcare bill. So there are a couple of different um, paragraphs here that already have comments attached to them. But you, you could hover over any paragraph and get a permalink, or um, or or add a comment to it. Um, in in my utopian world, this is how we would argue over over the content of bills is by you know throwing permalinks around. Again, again, it's it's, it's <laughs> the idea of the, of the URL. Saying something really concisely that that would otherwise take a long time to say, um, and then and then having like waging wars over the content in comment threads like these. 
Um, so how do I pull that? So I rearrange all of these um, between the refresh talk and now. So it might seem like I'm like looking at these slides, like gazing at them like they're ink blots or something. While I try to remember what it, what it was that I was trying to say. Um, so to make a set like this, so you, the first step is getting data out of government. Um, the problem with doing that is that government, to put it mildly, is not, that's not really government's wheelhouse, it's like technical matters. Uh, and so a lot of where government data exists, a lot of it's sloppy. Um, and it, so let's take Thomas as an example. Thomas is um, Congress's official site for getting congressional information. Um, you know, roll call votes, the, the, um, the text of bills, progress on bills, that sort of thing. Um, so this is, this is a, a typical bill page um, in Thomas. And I love this line, usually the last item is the most recent. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, it's so re reassuring when, I, when I'm using a web app and it tells me that usually something is the case. <laughs> Um, on, on top of which, I mean, you've got like you've got PDFs of um, uh, of, of versions of the bill, and in general, it feels more like 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 a um, I don't know. To me, it feels like a terminal at a library. Um, like it feels like this would all be more at home, like in green text against the black screen. But, um, so, isn't that actually what you want, though? You don't actually want humans to go to that page. You want people like yourself to actually go extract the real stuff and present it. That's what journalists do, after all. We want the government to give us the data. And so yes. if it looks like green screen, who cares? You mean, you've got right. people yeah. like Open Congress who really want to yes. make it usable. Right. And um, I, want the, I want the government to make it available. I, I, absolutely. The, the, the only problem I have with, with Thomas is that like, if, it, if it were just a bunch of you know, XML files or something that contain the raw data, that, that would be that would be an improvement over what we've got now. Right. Because straight right. right. Which is what so this is this is what GovTrack does. GovTrack is the the project of one <coughs> dude who does it in his spare time. I mean he's he's doing sort of consulting in this area now, but it was sort of a labor of love for him. Um, <coughs> and it's it's basically a, a collection of Perl scripts that do that sort of thing. That that scrape uh, government websites and make um, wrangle data into machine readable formats. Um, so, so like this is the site if you go to go, go track us, but it's also got like raw feeds of yeah, machine readable. Uh, it's got XML data dumps of everything that happens in Congress, and you can you can seriously go back to the first Congress and get XML over like the like the first thing that Congress did. Um, the, the yeah the at, at some point it switches to all caps that's fair that's doesn't bother um, and like like certain certain pieces of that are a bit more spread as we go back in time but like like you can look at all the bills that were under consideration in the first Congress two hundred something years ago um, that's actually that rocks by the way. yes that's totally rocks. this and I, I this launches a thousand ships. This is like if they if they gave out Pulitzer prizes for writing Perl scripts, this would. I mean, <laughs> as far as I know, every every site that distill that sort of distills and, pre and presents data from the U.S. Congress gets their data from GovTrack rather than having like writing their own stuff. This is this is a blessing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's GovTrack, open source and not profit. You can actually you can check out the source. Both the source of the site, which is written in some weird combination of like .NET running on, you, you know, running using Mono running on Unix or something, and then oh yeah, um, and then you know, like you can actually check out check out the um, there's a different repo for the the, the Perl script that, that he's using to to um, to scrape everything into machine readable format. Um, let's see. The Sunlight Foundation is one that I like, like, like to highlight. Um, so uh, I can tell you what they do, but you can see <coughs> their big text if you read it. Um, they've got, they've got a, a sort of a sister project called Sunlight Labs, which
which is about engaging developers to help make up more transparent. Um, they do, I'm gonna wait until I get a photo for that, so I can do it. Um, they, they offer several APIs of their own. Um, they're, they're involved in, 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 in Open Congress also. There's a collaboration between them and someone called the, the Participatory Politics Foundation. Um, but the, like both of which are not are not private themselves. Um, so they've got they the Summit Labs uh, website is uh, aims to sort of organize people around projects. Like you know if you if you've got a project that you're looking for help with or or vice versa, um, they've got like they've got like an apps directory uh, that sort of thing. They offer several APIs of their own. Uh, which I must have put in a different slide, um, which were very useful in the, the making of the thing I did, which is called filibusted. Um, this is something I did, it's about two years old. I did it a few months into the 111th Congress um, because the filibuster is one of my pet issues. Um, so, very quickly. So. In, in the Senate, you can filibuster. You can't do it in the House because there are rules that limit debate time. You can do it in the Senate. Um, to end a filibuster, you actually you have to um, like you have to invoke cloture, which um, which if it passes uh, adds special rules that, that limit the amount of time, like that the, the that limit the issue being considered to something like like only 40 more hours of debate time before um, if we have to take action. Um, the thing is, closure votes have a higher threshold of passage than everything else, than, than most other, other things in the Senate. Most things in the Senate, you need only a simple majority. Um, but you need, you need 60 votes or two thirds of all seated senators um, to pass a closure vote, which means that um, that, as we've seen in recent years, um, uh, I, a handful of senators working in collaboration can very easily make it so that 60 votes is the minimum um, for really taking any sort of action in the Senate. Um, and so, yeah, so we've seen that in recent years. Um, it's been aided by uh, some rules changes. Um, so this is a chart, so these are, these are like uh, meetings of Congress, so 66 would be um, uh, 30s, uh, late 30s or early 40s. Um, so the brown line is the number of cloture motions um, brought to a vote, um, and and the green line is the is the number of them that have actually passed with 60 votes or more. Um, so it's 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 a tactic of, of the minority to. Um, <coughs> To throw a wrench in the works, and because because it, it's one of the few tools at your disposal if you're the minority party in the Senate, then it ends up getting used by both parties. It, it's just it's just a matter of who who's out of power at the time. Um, so to bring more attention to this um, was was sort of, was sort of my goal. My ingredients were Rails because I'm a Ruby guy, um, a database, and an XML parser to to sort of to consume the, the data that GovTrack emits. Uh, what I do is I keep a list of current senators, which is pretty easy because one of, one of the one of the APIs that Sunlight Labs does is um, they've they've got one for the current membership of of Congress, including um, which which office they have their contact information. Um, you know, even stuff like if they have Twitter or YouTube accounts, that sort of thing. Um, phone numbers and uh, like like headshots, like photographs. Um, so going from that, import all that into a database. Every night, um, I grab that URL, um, or at least I did during the 111th Congress, because um, that. That's got a list of all the roll call votes that have happened in the Senate 
during the session. Um, and if I find new ones, I check to see if they were cloture votes, because they'll say on the cloture motion. So I record a bunch of information about them. Um, I, I record what the motion, what the cloture motion was on. It can be related to a bill, or an amendment of a bill, or a nomination, or a couple of other things. Um, and then I I look at how each senator voted on on that cloture motion. And then so I put it all on a page. So the cloture vote itself now has a URL. Um, you see what happened and when. You see, you've got links to the bill itself um, and to and to the vote. Those link to GovTrack. Um, you've got a list at the bottom right there. You've got a list of, of the senators that voted against cloture and therefore voted voted to prolong debate. Um, in case you wanted to uh, get in touch with them and, and you yeah, know raise hell about it. And uh, let's see, yeah, I tweet about it. So if you follow at filibuster on Twitter, you get you get one of these every time there's a cloture vote. Um, and then I, I keep stats, um, sort of as a, a report card on senators, to uh, to catalog their tendencies. Construction rate. Wow, that's yes. a great number. Yes. Um, yeah. So so you get you get a percentage, and then, then you can you can see which votes that senator actually participated in, and which ones um, which ones were were I and which were they. Um, and then, so on the right side, you know, you can see you get in touch if if you wanna if you wanna yell at them and have them ignore you. Um, that's what you can do. Uh, and then, keeping stats also on the 111th Congress, because um, one of one of the questions for me was whether we were going to break whether the 111th was going to break the record for closure motions that the previous Congress set. Um, so at so at this point there were seventy seven votes and eleven point nine four percent of of all roll call votes were cloture motions. Um, <coughs> and then I I tried to I tried to uh, uh, give some data views that like that were were valuable. Um, you can look at because because the Republicans were. Uh, in the minority in the 111th <coughs> during most of the filibustering. So you can look at which which Republicans were least likely to filibuster and which Democrats were most likely to filibuster and get a sense of, of, of who the centrists were. Um, so like the, the Democrats I find I find interesting because so three of them are are, are sort of noted centrists. There's Russ Feingold who's really just uh, ornery. Um, and, and then not, and not a centrist at all. No, no, but uh, ornery. I'll go with that. Is but is is high, like in his voting history was was highly likely to make votes um, like that that were just independent of how anyone else in his party voted. He was he's, his tendencies <coughs> were, were hard to predict. Um, and then Harry Harry Reid is on there because um, uh, he was sometimes obligated to vote against closure for procedural reasons. Um, anytime it looked like the closure vote was going to fail, then he had to be on. The winning side, so that, <coughs> so that he could introduce the motion again later. Um, so it's all on GitHub. You'll see that all this is the initial the initial check in on uh, you know two years ago. Um, one of one of the things I want to do better this this time around is, is actually have it have the public repository also be my private repository, and so any updates I make would 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 also go out to GitHub. Um, but reading that code gives you, I mean. Very little has changed conceptually with, with how it's done. Um, so now that so the first time I gave this talk, the 111th hadn't finished. Now, now that it has, I, um, I wanted to get some stats out there um, and sort of these are these are these are some things that I'm working on for um, for the, the new version of filibuster, which is going to happen someday. Um, Eighteen months. There, yes, exactly. <laughs> there haven't there haven't been any any culture votes yet, so I'm good. <laughs> um, so you're on you top know, of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like like the first version of filibuster came out like when Congress had already been in session for a couple of months, and so I was like ten votes behind. 
So that's interesting because you know the uh, the health uh, care repeal from the House yes. is dead in the Senate. There hasn't even been an attempt to do a vote to vote. Is what you're saying? They yes. just aren't even trying. Right. right. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so mm -hmm. very close. Didn't quite break the break, break the record for number of cloture votes held. Um, so again, Brown for introduced, screen for passed, and you'll see that now we've got the extra data point, and so the spike, we've, we're down a bit from the spike. Um, we did, did set a record for the, the number of cloture motions passed, so the green one is MSP. Um, I've colored these areas to give a bit of insight, like, partly to illustrate the point that, that both, like, both parties filibuster. So, in, in the blue areas, that's when the Democrats were in control of the Senate, and <coughs> in the red areas, that's when the Republicans were in control. So when it's blue, Republicans are doing most of the filibustering, and when it's red, Democrats are doing most of the filibustering. And so the, you know, the trend, um, the, the trend is, is, is pretty consistently upward, uh, no matter who's in power. Let's see, and so 92 closure votes held, um, 60 of them passed. 12.4% were closure votes, um, which was down from around 17% in the 110th. Um, this, is, this is something that I'm going to try to do more of in the next version of the full budget, is try to track the life cycle of, of the bill. What happens to the bill after, after the vote? Um, so there were 20 closure votes held uh, for, for bills that actually had a vote on passage. Um, at which point it would leave the Senate and either go to the House or go to the President. Um, all 20 of those bills passed. So that, that, that confirms the, the, the theory that, that, that a cloture vote is sort of the new gatekeeper for, for whether something gets passed or not. Um, it confirms the idea that a 60 vote threshold is what you need for, to actually pass legislation now. Um, I also want to keep track of this because I saw, I saw some interesting trends when I was looking at individual bills in the 111th. I saw several instances where senators who voted against cloture for a bill voted for the bill and vice versa. I, went, I wanted to try to figure out why that was and how, how common it was. So those votes are usually correlated, which makes sense. Like if you're, if you're opposed to a bill, you will, these days, senators tend to do whatever is at their disposal to prevent that bill. If that means voting against cloture, most of the time they they'll they'll do it. Um, and if you want to see the, the bill passed, then you'll vote for cloture because you're trying to get to a, to a vote on passage. But that's not always the case. So I put I put these names in quotes because they're awful names, but I can't figure out a way to express this uh, more briefly. <laughs> but I'm working on it. Contest. Uh, <laughs> Contestious. We'll, 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 we'll have a brainstorm. Everyone can write stuff down and pass it up. Um, so I, what I'm calling cowardly votes are people who voted against cloture but for the bill. And I can think of a couple reasons why a senator would want to do that. If they supported a bill but didn't want to, didn't want to go on record with their vote for some reason. If they supported a bill that perhaps was politically unpopular. Um, or maybe... Um, they supported the bill, but, but but felt like there hadn't been enough debate time. I mean, there are a few reasons you could. I mean, they're supporting their party leadership, right? right. Oh, it's, it's also a party right. chip. Yes, that, that's that's also that's also true, and uh, yeah, used used rather brilliantly by several several senators in, in the center on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, so, as an example, so Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which was passed in the last Congress, and involved giving the FDA more power to regulate tobacco and putting new and I believe larger warning, warning stickers on cigarettes, among other things. Um, there were 12, 12 senators who voted nay on cloture, but yay on passage of the bill. Um, the bill passed with uh, an overwhelming majority. Really, the only senators that, that opposed it were from tobacco states like uh, North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and so, and so the, the those senators voted nay on both cloture and on passage, but there were 
there were there were twelve Republicans who, who crossed over in between um, in between cloture and passage. Um, so the other uh, the flip side, and the name is just as bad, is um, voting for cloture but against the bill. I can think of a couple reasons why you might want to do this. Um, one is if you believe in the principle that a, that a bill should get an up or down vote, even if you even if you think it's a bit the even if you are not voting for the bill, um, then you would vote for cloture um, so, so that the bill could could have a chance to be considered. Um, yeah, and again, there there are other reasons. If you if you specifically wanted to go on the record as opposing a bill um, and voting voting against its passage, that's another reason I can think of that you would you would do this. Um, and this this happens with so the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was passed pretty early in the 111th, and it extended the the statute of limitations for being able to sue your employer for gender discrimination and pay such that the statute of limitations is reset with each discriminatory paycheck you get. Um, and so it was, it was, it was an interesting bill because it sort of pitted a women's rights issue against a, uh, you know, a, a, a business issue. Um, twelve senators voted yay on culture but nay on passage of the bill. So twelve senators, even though they, they disagreed with it, felt like E either felt like, on principle, it deserved a four vote, or felt like it would be politically disadvantageous to go on record as preventing it from getting a vote. Um, and so, oh Lord, let's see what I can do about this. There we go. Um, so. So th these are tables of, of the the most frequent um, offenders. I don't want to say offenders again. These are all loaded words. This is awful. Um, in in both categories, uh, and you'll you'll know. Like I, f I find this. I want to find out what like what there's actually a deeper meaning to this because there's some there's some names that show up on both both lists. Um, but this is like these are running stats from the 111. So these are the um, um, the people who, who exhibited these tents as you saw. Um, so there so I've talked I've just talked about like a few things that I want to do with the list that I haven't done yet, but I'm becoming more and more aware of <coughs> sort of its limitations. Um, and in general it, it all fa falls under the idea of, of that there's there's some there's some stuff that machines can't do. Um, all right, this is just a great. But bills, bills go by many names. Bills have an official title, but that's usually something that's a paragraph long. So this is an XML snapshot from GovTrack. These are all these are titles for an individual bill. You'll see that even the official title changes based on the phase it's in, when it's introduced, when it's amended by the House, by the Senate, and it typically has a half dozen different titles also. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really realize uh, the extent to which this was true until I noticed one day that there was there was a bill um, that that had several closure votes uh, attached to it. It was called the Service Members Home Ownership Tax Act of 2009. And I'm like, why on earth would that be controversial? But it's, its other name was the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. This was the Senate's version of the health care bill. What they did was, because it was a revenue bill, and the Constitution says revenue bills have to start in the House, but the Senate wanted, wanted to write its own legislation, um, as opposed to just using the House bill, they took a bill that had already passed in the House and pretty much <laughs> carved out its contents and put a new bill inside. So. You can do that? They did. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> That's what conference committees are for. <laughs> so there should be I mean, a headline that says sausage making. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted about that because, like, I pretty much everything the federal government does these days involves involves revenue in some way. So. I'm like that's that that's sort of the, the, the devil's advocate in me that says that maybe that's you know maybe that's something in maybe that's a rule that's antiquated. Um, 
And so, so you, you'll see that that even even GoTrack sort of um, keeps track of, of what the, the popular term for a bill is, because and this is another annoying thing, at least for me, is is when these when these bills are referred to um, in the press, they're almost never referred to by by any of the names that they go by in Congress. Um, you know, on one hand, I'm, I'm just annoyed because clearly people have, have spent a lot of time thinking of catching acronyms um, to. You know, to use for their their bill titles, and all their work is going to waste. Um, but but also but also because it's it's. I mean, it's hard to summarize a bill with with a title of any length. But when you just call it the jobs bill. Yeah, I I like jobs. That's sure. That sounds good. Do you know if the popular in that slide was is that human curated or? I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. So so not all of them are going to have that. Most most aren't really only the high profile stuff that, I, that I've yeah. noticed. Um, but there is a way that GovTrack can tell that it's the same bill. And What's the uh, bill number? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, there's a bill number. So like oh. you know, House Resolution two forty one or something like that. I was that's, wondering that's if that's the, the houses that could get confusing um, for humans. <clears throat> yeah. Well, <throat> although like when the Senate considers a bill, it's already been passed by the by the House. It still goes by the House name, which is uh, nice. Yeah. Um, but like when you have something like we did with, with the healthcare bill where, where, where the Senate has to think, well, both write versions, and, and the Senate even wrote two versions. And so the, like, it all just sort of got reconciled in one big sausage making process. Um, so this sort of leads me to my next point, which is that uh, nobody really understands uh, parliamentary procedure. And all order, order. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't understand parliament, parliamentary you know procedure. Whether you can do that, but I sort of instinctively, you know, because you said it confidently, I think you must <laughs> <laughs> Call um, a question. There's there's a whole there's a separate layer of of like we, we talk we talk about transparency and we mean that the stuff that the government does should be visible to people. But e even in that case, there's, there's <coughs> a different level of, of, of transparency at play. Um, so this, this is a tweet that sort, of, that sort of sums it up. It's not, not enough just to have access to data um, if, if all the data is in a foreign language that you don't understand. And in a, in a lot of ways, the parliamentary procedure acts, acts as sort of a, a, a um, like foggy glass, um, and prevents us really understanding what's going on. Um, this was prompted by what had, what had happened a week before that. So this was June of 2000, 2010. The week before um, was the first attempt to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell um, through the military, because the military appropriations bill was up for debate. And so one of the amendments to the bill was involved the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so, so, so this is a bot that tweets um, like updates from the House floor. So, so it's a bot that just looks for activity on, I, th I think it's Thomas, but it might be somewhere else. And, so, and sort of breaks them up into chunks and tweets them with, with a URL to the full thing. And so like a bot can, can go this far. A bot can't tell you what this means. What this means is, so yeah. So the human takes that, like a, a human who knows what that means, of which there are a few, takes that and translates it to, oh, that, that amendment is don't ask, don't tell. Um, and so this guy, David Waldman, was writing about this afterward and said, ah. yeah. um, that like there, like there were several things you had to know like before you could even understand what, what that meant. You had, to, you had to know that that was the don't ask, don't tell amendment. You had to know what it meant to consider it out of order and, you know, and like, even the timing of the announcement was significant. And the fact that Mr. Andrews gave notice. Well, I mean, Mr. Andrews wasn't the guy who wrote the amendment. He's just he's just the guy who's running the house on that day, and so even like even that is sort of not really significant uh, data. Um, and so, so that that's, <coughs> that's a separate problem. Like even if if the actions of government were completely transparent and reported to us by machine through Twitter bot or you know or whatever. Um, Whatever method we can <coughs> into, we would still look at most of it and go. I don't. I don't know what this means. Well, Watson will be able to handle it. Yeah, you know that's. Yeah, 
this is this is some of these. If like if they can if they they can make Watson read that <laughs> and know what it means, then that that will be impressive to me. Yeah. Well, it's like reading the old uh, congressional record, which used to be everything Congress did. Right. You know they had they printed books of it, and sometimes you're trying to find it. And it's like, you oh, did what order order to what? When, when I first had the idea for, for, for filibuster, I was, I was terrified that I would have to actually dip into the congressional record. Before the recess, uh, luckily, I didn't have to because I could just I could yeah. just read the roll call the Senate. Yeah, but yeah, that was that was on my mind. Uh, yeah. All right, so so there's that, and then there's the fact that uh, I would rename the slide if I could. But um, what I mean what I mean by this is some stuff just isn't just just outside outside the reach of machines. Whether it's just whether it's um, like in in filibuster case, in filibuster's case, it was the, the prevailing mentality of Congress at that time. There were there were several bills that that um, that were up for consideration that everyone knew had at least fifty votes in the Senate, but fewer than sixty. Um, and I, in particular, I can think of. Uh, cap and trade from global warming and um, the Employee Free Choice Act, which was um, which sort of faded into obscurity uh, pretty early in the Congress. Um, and um, I mean, in, bo in both in both of those cases, at least the prevailing wisdom is that is that they never even saw action on them in the Senate because um, because well, the Senate leadership knew, knew that they had no chance. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's an example of, uh, uh, you know, of, of a way that, like, in filibuster's case, the threat, of the, the threat of the filibuster asserts itself in ways that, that a machine can't measure. Um, and so the conclusion of all this is that you need hu humans to curate it. Um, machines serve an important step of sort of helping to humanize and, and distill the information, but they can only go so far. So what I'm charging each of you to do, um, you know, when you when you get around to it, um, <laughs> is pick a data source, um, figure out which parts are important and make, make URLs. The URLs are important. That's that's how people can, can talk about them. And not not feel like they have only a big idea of what you're talking about. It's, it's their way of saying, no, this, this person explains it better. Um, to do so, so you've got a number of data sources at, at your disposal. Um, so there's the GovTrack data dumps, which I talked about. Um, and if, if you go there, you, you seriously, you get a directory listing, starting at 1 and ending at 112, which is our current Congress. Um, and in each one is a bunch of XML files. Um, and so there are a few APIs that different people have built on top of that to to make it more um, uh, to make it a you know easier to use. Um, Sunlight Labs been working on this for a few months. I think just formally launched it. So what they're calling the Real Time Congress API, um, which I've I've sort of I used a couple of its its predecessors, and it's 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 pretty it's pretty easy to work with. Um, so Open Congress has its own API. There's a lot of overlap between these, but to, uh, like each API tends to offer like something that's that's unique to them. In, in Open Congress's case, they they do their own. Um, they they compile their own data on bill trends. They keep track of when people are blogging about bills. That they have their own legislative information also. Um, so yeah, Sunlight, Sunlight Labs has other APIs. Sunlight, Sunlight, the Sunlight Foundation has done a lot with, um, they've done a lot of follow the money type stuff. And so um, like one of, one of their big things is, is trying to surface and maybe even like draw explicit cause and effects with um, like, like how money asserts itself in politics, um, which is totally not my area. I, my eyes just glaze over. But um, but it's it is sort of an important thing. Um, so you can't make contributions. Yeah, they're also doing well. I'll get to the state by state stuff in a second. Um, New York Times is doing it has its own Congress API, um, which I've looked at a bit. 
so far, I haven't noticed anything they're doing that's that's that can't be had in one of the other APIs. Um, but um, you know, you, you can you can look at all these and choose the one that makes the most sense to you, the one that sort of feels right. Um, that I like is, is the big one. This is sort of this is a big coup for government data. Um, just the fact the fact that that it exists, I think, is a triumph. Um, it launched very in May 2009, very modestly with a really small number, number of data sources. Um, but this is this is government data, like any, any data dumps that any government office has, um, tends to find its way to data.gov. The problem with it is that it's um, it's pretty intimidating because you, you, there are a lot of data sources. And unless you really know, like it's not the sort of thing that you can just browse and think, oh, that looks interesting. You pretty much have to know what you're looking for. Um, and you'll see, so you'll see the columns on the right hand side. There's no, there aren't really any standards for um, the formats that um, that the data takes. Some in XML, some in CSV. Oh. Got KML files for hopefully for geo stuff. <laughs> um, RDF. Um, and so, uh, it's, it's, it's like computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a death. And so it's pretty much. Um, so, yeah. So my labs did. Yeah. So the only new I was more of a skeptic than we can imagine. Okay. <laughs> they've run a couple of um, of of congressional of like of <coughs> government app contests, and the second one they did was about that about go and they got. They got some good stuff. Um, let's see, state government is is a bit rougher, but um, there have been good efforts in the last couple of years. Um, Sunlight Labs has been doing something called the Open State Project, which is basically trying, like trying, trying to mobilize people to do the same thing for state governments, what as what, what the GovTrack guy did for Congress, finding where. Each state publishes its its you know its information on, on what happens in the legislature um, and you know where like where it's where it's insufficient trying trying to get them to um, commit to sort of a, like a higher level of you know whether it's whether it's you know it's not going to work that you just stand in a, a you know a, a printed page of what the legislature did that day. And Put that out as PDF. That's not going to work. There's like something scrapable. I think is the baseline. Um, and then um, sort of sort of organizing all of that. They did they did something interesting. They had they published a, a repository in GitHub, and so every, so people could fork that, um, add support for their state, or you know collaborate and support for their state, and then send pull requests back to Sunlight Labs so that they could pull that through. I thought that was an excellent way to do it. Um, that's all I've got. Yes. So you basically did this project for fun. Yes. And so has any. That's a very weird idea of what, what fun I, is. I understand that. Um, did any value come out of this for you that you didn't expect? Connections, opportunities, uh, just, you know. I'm always interested, like, where these side projects take people, other than coming here to talk to us. <laughs> um, no, I didn't, like, I, because that wasn't, cause, because that wasn't the goal, like, I didn't, I didn't really try to, try to, to pimp this out to anyone, um, or even, or even market it much, because that's, I'm sort of awful at marketing anything I've done, or myself, or, yeah. Um, what so when I first had the idea to do this, um, like I ended up submitting it for Sunlight Labs first um, contest. That's they call, they're called the Apps for America contest. I, I ended up submitting it for the first one, um, and it won. So the money was nice because I was I was between jobs at that point. That's that's good. pretty much the only thing that I can think of. That's a good thing, and then it gets promoted because you're a contest winner. Right. Yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. Good. Well, but but again, like 
or media sources like picking it up and using it and, and, and then contacting you and saying, hey, we need you to do this for us? Or uh, it got mentioned on, on, on NPR. I saw, I saw a spike when that happened. Christian McDonald from the Statesman had seen his talk at Refresh, and he was the one who recommended that we have Andrew come to speak to us. So the Statesman was very interested in what he had been doing. Whether or not they've asked you to <laughs> collaborate with them, I don't know, but they were certainly interested. There, it's, I think it was also in the back of my mind that, that I, didn't, I didn't want to actively push it to, to a point where it was, it was going to, like where I couldn't maintain it, or where, sure. where it was going to take, because I knew it was a side project. And I didn't. I didn't. Like I, I, I didn't want it to end up consuming all of my free time unless it was sort of an organic growth. Kind of so people didn't show up out of the out of the bushes to help you with that chop wood, carry water kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, because it was out there as an open source. I don't. I don't think. I don't think there are there are even any bushes where I live. <laughs> did, any bush Crawford, dude. Lots of bushes. did any senators or their offices contact you about any of the information or how it was presented? Uh, no. Okay. That's amazing. No. That's really amazing. Do you have any visitors you Um, it's, it's, I haven't looked in a while. But, yeah. I know a lot of people using it for resources. Theoretically, this is being reported. Does it affect Google Analytics? It's it's I mean it's definitely a, a non notable figure. I like I get I, I get the sense that the, that the people who are visiting are the ones who follow Toolbuster on Twitter, and and so are, are are clicking through to read it. So have you made an API to digest this stuff so that those of us can pull your hard work into our own? Um, not no I ha I haven't yet, and I would I would hesitate because I don't know how much. How much value it's adding? Like, I'm not really doing much transformation of content. I'm, I'm just, I'm just picking up on the fact that there was well, so, You know, say I, I had a, you know, page that for whatever reason that listed senators, and I wanted to actually bring your data in as part of the uh, my portfolio of that senator that I'm publishing. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice to have an API and just go get it, so I don't have to scrape it and then reformat it. You can totally scrape it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, don't want to, I want to do the easy thing because you already have the order in it. You already know the structure. If you That's did true. nothing more than expose your crud, I'd be happy, of course. I, I will I'll consider that for the next version. Couldn't they also take a copy of your code and then just parse the information themselves? Yes, they could. That's not true. That required yes. a little bit more. Which is, I mean, which which would be far more feasible when when I make it to the that the version on GitHub is actually the most recent version, because then all of the bugs that I introduced will have been fixed by me. So, <laughs> yeah, basically just doing the letting it get all of it, dump it to me as JSON. I'll be a happy guy. Then I'll put RDF all over it. <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 not doing a good job of selling this to me. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you very much. I, mean, I really like to see where side projects take people because my side projects have been the kinds of things that have taken me much further than official professional things. So. Yeah. Um, and uh, before we leave, I just uh, <coughs> wanted to plug a project that my students are doing during South by Southwest. They're already starting to do previews of panels at sxtxstate.com. They're interviewing people. Uh, they're going to be on site during the interactive, and uh, we have SXTX status on Twitter. So hopefully you guys will follow us and tune in, maybe make some comments on some of the work they're doing. Thanks again for coming. If you want to stick around for a few minutes and chat, there's more sodas, some more sandwiches. Uh, yes. And I will be in touch about the Hacks Hackers Party during South by Southwest. Thanks again. Yes.